Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Heather Goldstone. I'm going to be moderating the panel portion of, of this evening. Um, I'm really thrilled to be here. And as someone who has produced a few six-minute audio story, stories in my life, I can testify that telling a story in just six minutes um, really is quite difficult, even when you don't have the uh, video component to put in there. And I almost wish we could watch that again. It goes by so quickly. <laughs> There's a lot in there. but. Um, We've got some of the stars of the story with us this evening, and so instead what we're going to do for about 45 minutes is dive into more deeply, um, no pun intended, um, what we just saw um, in brief in, in the film in just six minutes. Um, I have some questions to start off for the panel, uh, but then we're going to turn it over to you guys for your questions, and of course also to our audience online. We have someone who, here who will be able to, if you're watching on Facebook Live, uh, send us your questions and we will make sure that those uh, get into the discussion as well. Uh, Sam already introduced our panelists. We have name tags. Um, if you have a, a program, you also have bios, so we're not going to spend our time reading through um, titles and bios. Instead, we thought we would start off um, with, with kind of an opening statement from, from each person. Um, to get us started on this evening. And Simon, I want to start with you. Um, it got mentioned very briefly in the film. And it's a really big question. And that's the question of why we should care about coral reefs. They're beautiful. Yes. What, what else um, do coral reefs do for us? And, and why should we care? Yeah, it's a good question, right? It's, uh, I think most of us probably have seen, either you have either dived or snorkeled on coral reefs. but. Um, and it, that's obviously a, a great thing to do. But the, from coral reefs, actually, uh, perhaps a billion people um, on the planet depend on coral reefs for their livelihoods, for the protein that comes from coral reef fisheries, from the protections that those reefs play for the coastal environment that they live in. Um, and it just, it's a, it's a quirk of nature, but a lot of those countries actually are in the developing world. And so, um, that it's really important in the sense that they're feeding their kids with this, with this protein from, fi from fisheries on coral reefs. So um, it's not something that we can necessarily um, simply stop. Uh, someone's going to feed their kid no matter what, right? Um, so what we have to do is we have to, in some sense, come up with a way of working uh, with that understanding that there is a human dimension to coral reefs as well, that they provide all these ecosystem services that we can certainly take for granted, but um, it's, you know, they can do everything from, you know, protecting co villages from cyclones or hurricanes to perhaps providing cures for cancers and other diseases that we simply don't know yet. So um, they, the ecosystem services, the benefits that coral reefs bring to, to us all, but particularly for people in the, de in the developing world, uh, um, are simply um, too numerous to name and, and exquisitely important to, to the globe. So, Anne, you alluded to this in the film, but what is the, the definition of a super reef, um, and how did you first find them? Thanks, Heather. So, I just wanted to start by, by putting this in perspective. The last five years have been the warmest years on record, and coral reefs are protesting. They're the canaries in the coal mine, and they are raising the red flag. And they're doing that by bleaching and dying. And you know that uh, in 2015, 2016, there was a lot of media coverage about the Northern Great Barrier Reef. 83% of corals on the Northern Great Barrier Reef died in one heat wave. That is what we're dealing with. It's urgent. Now, we've been going out on expeditions to coral reef islands across the tropical Pacific, across the Caribbean. We've seen a lot of death. But we also see coral reefs that are not dying. Coral reefs that appear to be able to deal with what's going on. But they're not necessarily safe. We've seen coral reefs survive heat waves that are then blown up by fishermen with dynamite or with cyanide or killed in other ways. So what we need to do is, and what we're doing is working with conservation organizations, with coral reef uh, island nations, 
to make sure that those coral reefs that can survive climate change, by what any, whatever mechanism, whether they're genetically adapted or whether there's some freak in the, of the oceanography that's allowing them to survive, to protect them and make sure that they're not killed by, our, um, by us not paying attention. So we, find, we have found them up to now, probably um, a lot of the, the super reefs that we found have been sort of by accident. We go out there expecting to find dead reefs after a heat wave, we jump in the water, the reefs aren't dead. They're thriving, they're, they're beautiful coral cover, plentiful fish. And over the past few years, um, our team, including my postdocs and my students sitting over there, we've been digging into the details to try to understand how these coral reefs are surviving. And when we get the mechanism, when we understand what they're, what they're doing to survive, then we can predict, we can look out across the global ocean to predict where the other super reefs will be. And that's our, our pr procedure moving forward. Thank you, Heather. Thanks. And that's a perfect segue, Annie, to the work that you're doing, which is diving into those mechanisms, trying to figure out some of, of how these super corals essentially get their superpowers. So what do we know about that at this point? Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to everyone for coming out here and for being interested in coral reefs. I think this is what we need. You know, we need people that are interested in uh, spreading awareness and spreading um, motivation to know more about these reefs as well as protect them, so thank you for that. Um, my work has been looking at the genetics behind some of these sort of super corals or super reefs. And so Anne has been talking about super reefs, so a, a super reef we're talking about the entire ecosystem, right? There can be several hundreds, if not thousands of species of different corals on a, on a reef. And like a community, they're gonna be working together and they might have sort of things that come about, about all the interplay of those species that are on that reef as well as the oceanography that might make that reef particularly strong, particularly strong in tolerating a, a heat wave or not. I'm a little bit more interested in the coral itself, so looking at an individual species and how that species might have genetically adapted to tolerate certain conditions. And so the work that goes into that also involves diving and, and getting a lot of samples and then going back into the lab and extracting DNA and doing all sorts of analysis to then say, you know, if we see, for instance, a, a colony that has had multiple stress bands in the past but is still doing very well and has been able to survive those over time, genetically, do we see any differences between that colony and one that perhaps died in the last heat wave? You know, and how do we start to pinpoint what genetic mechanisms those um, individual colonies might have? And when we start understanding that, we can say, well, if it's just one gene, if it's a multiple genes, if there's just a combination of both genetics and environment, which most likely there is, but it starts to give us an idea of how quickly we might be able to expect other reefs to respond in the same way from an evolutionary perspective. So it gives us a little bit of a time frame of how, how much time we have or what we can expect. Reefs that maybe aren't at the most vulnerable locations, they might have a little bit more time before their reef gets really warm, how much time might they have to catch up essentially to climate change and be able to survive. Um, so that's most of what I've been doing. Thank you. Uh, Lizzie, we heard in the film that uh, Palau is one place where there's already been some work to uh, try to conserve and protect, protect climate resilient reefs. I wonder if you could give us a, a broad overview of where those kinds of efforts stand and how the work that Anne and, and Hanny are doing are changing, perhaps, our approach to conserving coral reefs. Sure. Um, so I've been doing coral conservation for a long time. Um, I've been at the Nature Conservancy for about 15 years. And when I started, um, you know, our focus was really on addressing direct threats like pollution and sedimentation and overfishing, destructive fishing. And that was it. And despite the fact that we would create these protected areas and in some cases control these really well, 1998 happened and we saw really significant coral loss from thermal stress. The oceans got hot, corals bleached, and in many cases they died. That was a huge wake-up call for the conservation community, for communities that depended on reefs, 
and for governments around the world. And it helped us to realize if we don't think about climate change, no matter how good we're doing at managing our reefs, we're gonna miss the boat and we could lose them. And so we started changing the way we design protected areas. And part of that is having the critical science to tell us where reefs are naturally positioned to survive. And this is where Anne's research is so critical because if we can identify these places where corals are naturally surviving and we can protect them from all of these other threats that are happening to reefs around the world, then we give them a chance to survive and reseed damaged reefs. So there's this critical science piece that Anne brings to it, but I, I also wanna share another piece. When I stand up and give talks about coral reefs now, there is so much doom and gloom in the newspapers, in journalist articles you read, the obituary of the Great Barrier Reef, the Great Barrier Reef is dead and gone. And journalists and others are mischaracterizing what's happening. There is a definite threat, but there are natural places that are really doing well and are surviving. And Anne was able to show us in a place in Palau called Nico Bay that was bathed in acidified waters. These were waters we thought couldn't even inhabit corals because they were so acidic and they were thriving. And so these stories of hope are so critical for maintaining the enthusiasm, the commitment, the action that people have to continue to invest in conservation efforts around the world. They're not the norm. Corals are absolutely threatened. Climate change is absolutely giving them a run for their money, you know, and we have to get mitigation. We have to get CO2 emissions under control. But we do have strategies that we can implement that give corals that boosted chance of surviving and maintain those ones that are naturally positioned to survive. So, Buster, as the filmmaker, there are a lot of different ways one could tell a story. Why tell this story with film in particular, and what role do you see this kind of film playing in the science and conservation efforts um, around corals? Well, I think where we <coughs> intersect with one another, and there are many different places that you could start that uh, conversation, but I think the intersection occurs uh, regarding evidence. The film actually uh, provides an opportunity for us to examine what we consider to be evidence and whether or not we actually accept the evidence that is pre being presented. And I think that in some respects, you know, what we're understanding how film and science work very well together is that uh, film is a, a, is a great vehicle for being able to translate the evidence that science uncovers for us. But it's, uh, it's not just the knowledge that has been uncovered and, um, and learned by scientists that um, is critical to the filmmaking process. It is actually the storyteller herself that presents in some way uh, a manner for us to both uh, accept the science but also to trust the message that goes along with the science. Um, I have to say that when I came down here to meet Anne and uh, the rest of the folks who were all part of this project, um, I was immediately taken by the passion that Anne presented in terms of helping me pay attention. And I feel like, you know, we are overwhelmed with media demanding eyeballs, demanding us to have a response to all of the crises that are going on. But what Anne convinced me almost immediately was that there was a humanist perspective that I needed to grasp. And part of it was just in her voice and in her passion and her uh, ability to make me care about what isn't known about coral and why that work as a scientist is so important. So I think the union between the media and between what goes on in terms of the gathering of evidence that becomes science is one where we're translating both what it is that we have learned, but we're translating it in a way to understand what it means to us as, as, uh, as neighbors, as uh, members of a, of a neighborhood. Um, as members of this community. And for me, Anne's done a fantastic job. Anne, I wonder if, if you and Hanny could maybe talk a little bit about 
how super reefs might be able to help other reefs. That gets mentioned in the film. Uh, there's, there's been, I think, a lot of um, media coverage and a lot of excitement around efforts to do coral reef restoration, to possibly even try to genetically engineer coral reefs to survive not just climate change, but other human-caused threats. I mean, is, is that the direction we're going with this, or is this more about protect these, essentially, islands of, of resilience and, and then just let nature take its course? Sure. Um, yeah, so I think one way, um, so first, as Anne mentioned, reefs can be used for super reefs for a variety of reasons. If one of those reasons is that the, genetically the corals there have a, an ability to tolerate warmer temperatures, right? They have evolved over time to live in warmer environments and they are just genetically capable of doing that. If those corals um, reproduce, their larvae are gonna carry with them that genetic basis for that thermal tolerance. And so if they go to a neighboring reef that's not as thermally tolerant, then those new larvae, as was mentioned in, in the film, they're gonna settle, they're gonna grow, and that reef over time will become more thermally tolerant as they come they get essentially new um, migrants that have a higher thermal tolerance. So that's one way in which super reefs can, can help not just the reef that they're on, um, but also neighboring reefs where the larvae can disperse to. So if it's a genetic mechanism that's sort of keep that population in the wild, protect it, allow it to reproduce, and let those larvae disperse, and then essentially um, repopulate reefs that haven't been uh, as lucky as the, the super reefs that we're talking about. I mean, and on that, that same kind of topic, what value do you see um, or what limitations do you see to approaches of trying to, maybe a more heavy-handed approach would be one way of saying, of humans going in and trying to modify or engineer reefs to survive human impacts? Um, thanks, Heather, for the question. I think what I'd like to do first is just is, um, is continue from the point that Henny made. Um, if we... Uh, protect a diverse and large area of corals of mixed species and mixed shapes and mixed sizes and they all have this um, ability to to resist heat um, they're going to make um, they're going to have larvae or make babies that have an equally diverse uh, set of genes and Corals don't only have to deal with heat in the ocean. They also have to deal with waves and currents and different light regimes and fish that are trying to eat them and other fish that are trying to eat their babies. So there's a whole uh, host of factors that corals need to be adapted to. Um, so what we want to do is we want to conserve or protect a diversity of genomes that are all thermally tolerant so that when they go out to a different uh, regi oceanographic regime, when they're sent out on the currents to a reef system that's in a different oceanographic regime, there are going to be larvae amongst that cohort that can survive those conditions and grow. So, so we're not only protecting thermal tolerance by protecting natural reef systems, but we're protecting the genetic diversity that they need to survive the wide range of conditions that are out in the ocean. I think there's a place to, add, to directly address your question. The protection of super reefs, as we're calling them, is just one, it's one very important strategy in a multi-pronged approach that is needed to ensure that coral reefs don't go extinct in many of our lifetimes, because that's basically what we're, we're facing right now. And the 2015 El Nino, the 2015 heat wave was a huge wake up call, I think, to the world of what we're gonna lose if we don't do this. So coral restoration, genetic engineering, these are things that are all happening, and then the protection of, super, of naturally um, tolerant reefs in their natural environments are, are all approaches that we need to take to make sure that we don't lose coral reefs forever. Well, I'm gonna inject just a, a small amount of, 
I don't know about skepticism, but I mean, there must be a limit to what these corals can take, right? I mean, because they're surviving the heat waves that we have now, um, even if we protect them, does that guarantee that corals will be able to adapt to and survive continued heating, continued acidification in the oceans, and the, and the continued other impacts that you're talking about from humans and, and just their ecosystem? But what we're doing by protecting the climate resilient corals now is actually giving them time as well to adapt. So they're not going to stay the same forever, but what we want to do is to give them the opportunity to also adapt, to also evolve as the, as the temperatures go up, uh, the, the adaptation will increase. We need to give them, but we need to give them the opportunity to do that. Um, at the same time, obviously, what we have to do is cap CO2 emissions and get climate change under control. That's, that's the no-brainer component. But even if we cap CO2 emissions today, we, we're locked into future warming. So we need, to, we need to deal with that, and we need to um, salvage uh, coral reef ecosystems and other marine and terrestrial ecosystems at the same time. Simon? Along the same lines, um, we've already made the distinction between super corals and super reefs. What about the rest of the ecosystem, even if the corals have a mechanism for resisting heat? Can the other uh, plants and animals, the, other, the rest of the ecosystem, adapt with them? And, and can we expect a whole ecosystem to adapt and survive? Um, I think the answer to that is that um, is in some sense yes that um, corals are in some sense particularly sensitive to temperature in a way that for instance fish that I work on mainly um, are not so the, we don't need to worry about coral reef fishes going extinct from warming oceans because they do just fine in the warming oceans um, and so I'm sure there's a lot of ecosystem services provided by reefs that um, are going to be okay um, with the warming that we see on the horizon. Um, the corals are, I, I don't like to think of them um, as being in some sense fragile. They're, they're, they're not. They're, they're, they're resilient in their own rights, but they have this unique um, symbiosis with, with these microalgae that just make them particularly sensitive to to temperature, and it's really that, that that's the, that in, in essence is the problem. So they have a problem, they have difficulties dealing with temperature that a lot of the other organisms on coral reefs simply don't have. And as the film makes clear, um, a lot of those other organisms are only on these reefs because of the corals. The corals really are the keystone for that, that whole ecosystem that, um, that we simply can't afford to lose. Does he, as Simon mentioned early on, humans are part of coral reef ecosystems, and uh, we've mentioned places like Kiribati and Palau. A lot of these, well, reefs in general, but a lot of the super reefs that have been found um, are in the waters of developing nations. What extra dimensions does that add to efforts to protect those reefs, and, and how do you navigate that? I think it's worth pointing out that um, you know, the Pacific Islands contribute less than 0.01% of the world's global emissions. And yet they are facing largely the greatest impacts of climate change to their communities um, from sea level rise and storm impacts um, and bleaching on their corals, heat stress on their coral reef systems. So there is a climate justice issue, I think, at stake um, in, this, in this space. I think that you also have island communities who in many places depend directly on those reefs for their food, for their livelihoods. But I think what's interesting is that we often tend to think of these things as happening halfway around the world. Um, and we did some research with a, a scientist at the Nature Conservancy who found that reefs actually can reduce wave energy up to 97%. So he started looking at the coastal protection value in the Caribbean, where you have chronic hurricanes coming in, looking at off of the east coast of Florida, looking at off of, you know, looking at how storms are affected by protective barriers out in the water and how that's reducing some of the wave energy coming on shore, which drove home the fact that these are critically important for island communities and they're critically important for Americans as well. 
And so I think, you know, in terms of identifying these super reefs, we can use them to inform where we prioritize protection. And we can look at it in places like developing countries as priorities where we need to protect them for all of those services. But we also have to think about how they benefit us in this country and how we need to ramp up our own protection and identify those in our own backyards as well. I have one more question for Buster, and then I want to um, open it up to audience questions. So start getting your questions ready. We will have microphones coming around. I'm just curious what we're, I'm sure there's a huge list of, of challenges for making any film, but what was the biggest challenge in making this particular film? Making it short. <laughs> <laughs> Anne had a lot to say. <laughs> no, it's a big challenge because I think that in some respects, uh, we're all hungry for uh, gaining a lot more knowledge than this film provided. Um, so why make it I, so short? Well, we live in an age right now where we were making a film for a targeted audience, which was essentially an audience that was needed to be introduced to... Um, uh, feeling positive about a crisis. And that was essentially the goal. And uh, in some respects, this is not a science film. This is an advocacy film. It's advocating a change of uh, mind and requesting support to be a participant in the change that needs to take place. That change being protection, that change being conservation, that change being particularly uh, the pursuit of um, science and, and, and new knowledge regarding coral. But I think uh, this, this kind of film actually to be longer is really more a film that's about process, um, about um, uh, the struggles that, uh, that all of us uh, go through in terms of trying to understand what it is we're trying to understand. Um, and then also the consequences of what's going on. This does not really get into the consequences in a way in which I think a documentary would uh, pursue, but that takes a much longer film. And the audience we were looking to reach for this particular audience was an audience was going to be um, short attention span, maybe. That would be unfair <laughs> for all of us sitting here. I think much more it's actually a conversation starter and recognizing that uh, there's a lot to be talked about and that in some respects, uh, a good deal of what film does very successfully is a convening authority. I'm a great believer that actually uh, motion pictures have a huge impact in the way in which we decide to um, invest time in our lives. Um, and it happens because we gather together as a, as, as a community. So film is bringing us together to do what we're doing right now. And short films are good for that. All right, well, let's get the conversation Broader, more broadly started. Um, we, have, we have a question over here. We can get a microphone. And please do use the microphone um, in particular so that our audience online can hear your question. And I'll try to repeat your question to make sure that happens. 50 years ago, I was told that uh, corals in Florida Keys were dying due to pollution. We also know they're attacked by predators and microorganisms. I wonder how you, uh, first of all, the relative importance of these different problems, how do you distinguish between them, and whether the remedial action you take is different depending on the source of the whatever is killing the corals. Thank you. All right, so, that's a Lizzie question. Lizzie? So, yes, I think um, Florida right now is facing, as many of you may have heard about, a massive disease. Um, that has wiped out half of the species um, on the Florida reef track. It's uh, stony coral tissue loss disease, and they're not exactly sure what's causing it. They think it's bacterial. It seems to be responding slightly to antibiotics. They're using amoxicillin, which is what I give my kids when they're sick. Um, but it's really difficult. I mean, it is decimating huge amounts of, of the corals there. Lizzie, can I interrupt for one second? Yeah. How do you give corals amoxicillin? <laughs> so there's different strategies. There's different strategies. They're actually, one of the strategies they're using in Florida is to actually dig a trench. Um, the disease is a really, it's a very strong and virulent disease that kills corals quite quickly. Uh, within a month, you can have, you know, 60% coral mortality. And so they're actually 
creating barriers. So they're digging a trench and then filling that trench with um, their epoxying, trying to block, and they're actually, they can inject corals with amoxicillin. Um, there's a danger of, you know, they're trying to encourage divers who might accidentally kick a coral with their fin and then touch another coral who are inadvertently spreading disease. Um, so they're trying to change dive practices. Um, we absolutely target conservation actions based on the, the major threat that's happening. So we have different strategies for different threats. Um, so, you know, we can't clearly go out and inoculate every coral. Um, you know, they're looking at, was it water quality? I mean, the, the, the disease started off of Miami. It was a particularly warm during a bleaching event and there was dredging going on. And so they're looking at, was this a combination of, of heat stress and some kind of pollutant in the water? Um, you know, and so you really want to target your, your intervention based on what that, what's causing the greatest amount of decline. Um, there's a, a researcher in Hawaii who is telling me, um, Bob Richmond, he said, we are now able to do a test on coral, like a blood test that you take on yourself, to tell what chemical, what pollutant is actually responsible for killing that coral. And they thought it was sewage outflows in this one particular area, and they realized it was people's swimming pools. They were draining their pools, and there was a chemical in the pool that was actually driving the coral decline. So there's new and innovative technologies that we can actually use, not only to say, is it pollution, but what is that pollutant that's actually causing the decline in the coral? So I think that's where science is so critical because we can't, you know, we have to prioritize our management actions and we want to know which are the ones that, that are really going to give us the greatest benefit. And so having that kind of key science that helps us be strategic about how we perform those interventions is absolutely essential. Thank you. Have a question right here? Actually, oh. Uh, yeah, hi. I, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for a very interesting presentation. I guess I'm confused about one fundamental thing, and that's uh, both have mentioned uh, increased temperature and acidification. And the question that, that comes to my mind is, are these linked in some way, or can you disentangle the effects of, of increased temperature? And what's the mech if it's increased temperature, what's the mechanism uh, that by itself would be so destructive to the coral reef. So it's, it's kind of confusing to me what is actually going on. I think that's a, a great question, I think, especially in light of, of how much we have heard about the threat of ocean acidification in the past few years. And then we've, we've been here for, uh, what, half an hour or so, and haven't really talked, I mean, it came up once, right? We've really been talking about heat. So how are those two related? And, and is, is one a greater threat than the other? Yeah. They are linked. Uh, so ocean warming and ocean acidification are caused by the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Uh, ocean acidification specifically, the ocean is absorbing a lot of that CO2, and like Coca-Cola, it's becoming more acidic. So because corals um, and coral reefs are made of calcium carbonate. So all of those coral reefs that you saw in the movie, the only reason they're there is because corals produce calcium carbonate that actually build the reef structure and make islands. Um, that's soluble. So when you lower the pH of the ocean, um, the calcium carbonate can start to dissolve. So that's the issue with ocean, that's the reason ocean acidification is problematic, potentially problematic for coral reefs. The same as we emit greenhouse gases and CO2 into the atmosphere, the atmosphere is heating up and the ocean is heating up in concert with that. I think of ocean warming as the most efficient mass killer of corals on a global scale. Uh, pollution, uh, dynamiting, cyanide, these are local threats. These can be locally managed. Heat waves come in. Um, and they kill corals across the Pacific Basin. They kill millions of corals in a few months or, or even a few weeks. Um, you can have a thriving coral reef one week and the next week everything is dead. And that's happening more and more. I've worked on both uh, impacts of ocean warming and impacts of ocean acidification on coral reefs. 
Um, this movie and our, and our Super Reefs program focuses on ocean warming because it is an urgent, urgent threat. And if we don't preserve the corals, if we don't protect the corals that are managing to survive that heat, we won't have time. We'll run out of time before ocean acidification becomes a problem. Coral reefs will be gone before ocean acidification becomes a problem. So, so if, 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 trying to understand your answer, uh, we're used to thinking about heating giving rise to very small temperature changes in the water because of the high heat capacity. So uh, given that, what is the mechanism that a small change in temperature by itself is such a killer for the corals? That's what I'm confused about. So the coral reefs that are that we know today, the coral reefs that we dive on and, we fi and people fish on, and some, some of us fish on, um, and a billion people around the world are, are living on, um, they evolved through the Holocene, through the last 10,000 years. And the ocean temperatures over that time period have been pretty stable, um, oscillating maybe between one and uh, around um, one degree Celsius. So we see pretty stable, so they have evolved, these coral reefs have evolved, and the coral relationship with their symbionts, these little algae that live inside their cells, um, has evolved over pretty stable temperatures. Now in the last 100 years, the temperatures in the tropical oceans have increased by about one degree Celsius. Not only has that background temperature increased, but the size, the amplitude of the El Nino heat waves has increased. And that is thought to be linked to the increase in the ocean heat content. So in the last th 30 years, we've had three what we call super El Ninos. The 82, 83, the 97, 98, and the 2015, 2016. And these are massive heat anomalies that cause about five degrees Celsius warming above what coral reefs normally see. So we, see, we have a background warming of about one degree Celsius over the 20th century, and then we have these huge heat waves that come in, and they spike the temperatures up about five degrees Celsius. Death everywhere. And we've seen it. We go in, jump in the water, there's nothing left. And do we understand why they bleach and eject their their symbionts, those algae, or is that still one so of the those reason questions that coral reefs, that corals can make reefs is because they have these little plant cells inside them that give them food and allow them to grow really, really fast. It's like having milkshakes every day, and you can grow really fast, and they can build these reefs. And it's incredible to think that these tiny little organisms can build the Great Barrier Reef. That's what they're doing. These tiny little things, like a Ziploc bag full of water, is building the Great Barrier Reef. They do that because they have plant cells inside of them that live inside them. And for the most part, it's really harmonious and everything's really cool. The problem is that that relationship is very temperature dependent. And when it gets too hot, and it can just be one or two degrees hotter than normal, the algae start to make toxins inside of the coral cell. And the coral's like, this doesn't feel good. What's going on? And start spitting out the algae. And you can see the algae coming out of the coral mouth. The coral doesn't know, of course, that by spitting out these little algal cells that live inside it, it's actually ejecting its primary food source. Because the algae, like plants on land, they photosynthesize and they pass that, photo, that, that carbohydrate to the coral. That's its primary energetic source. So like we say in the movie, ocean heats up, things become toxic inside the coral, the coral spits out the algae, and then they starve. And we've actually watched this happen. Corals go from nice and fat and healthy to really, really thin, and then they die. And that, that's the process. That's what we're seeing happening. Can I just add one, one last thing to that? Um, <laughs> so in terms of like why such a small temperature change could be so significant, like if you think of, this isn't like the, the most scientific analogy, but 
if you think of just us as humans, right, we have a very particular range of temperature in which we like to operate. And if we go just like two degrees Fahrenheit, we're, we're sick, right? We have a fever. And so that starts messing up our physiology. We start doing things that our body isn't supposed to be doing, and it's very dangerous. And so similarly, in this relationship, right, those algae like to be in a very particular temperature, and they're like little engines. They're just there photosynthesizing, making sugars, and giving it to the corals. And if they get too much temperature or too much light, essentially it's like, a, like an overheating car, and that's gonna start causing all sorts of chemical um, sort of reactions that shouldn't be happening. It's gonna stress out the coral, and then they're gonna spit them out. So even though it's a small change in temperature, it can be really, really significant to the overall health of that, that colony. I think one, sorry, just, I want to add one quick thing that I yeah. think is important to mention too, and that is um, bleaching events happen naturally, and they've happened over time, and it can be caused by pollution, and it can be caused by temperature. It's a stress response of coral. The problem now is that these thermal stress events, these mass bleaching events used to happen every 25 years, 20, 25 years. Now they're happening every five, six years. Projections are that they're gonna be an annual event. And that is a problem because it means there's less time between the events for the corals to recover. If it gets really hot and the corals kick out their symbiotic algae, they can actually bring them back in and recover if it doesn't stay too hot for too long. But when you have these sustained over multi-year, the 2015 to 2017 was the longest heating event on record. And so there was no time for the corals to recover in between those events. So that is where I think now we're seeing much more significant impacts is the time scale between these events is getting shorter and shorter. Okay. Do um, you have a microphone right here? Yes. Uh, I'm interested in understanding the concept of seeding uh, using the super reefs. As I understand it, your idea is to uh, identify the super reefs protect them, and then expect them to spread naturally through the rest of the ocean and settle in different places where the coral has uh, died. Uh, the question I have is, one, what percentage of the coral reefs are super reefs? Is it 10 percent, 5 percent? Secondly, how long would the seeding process take place uh, is it realistic to actually think that this might happen? Um, would it take place over a 10-year period or whatever? So th those are two questions I have. They're two great questions, and I just want to let you guys know we're about to run out of time. Um, so this is probably going to be our last question. Other questions, we will be you know, able to, to continue chatting, um, as Sam said, over, over beverages and, and uh, some snacks out there. So. Um, Yes. Do you want to, who wants to, to take this on? Um, right. So uh, to repeat the question, is it uh, realistic to think, well, first of all, what percentage, do we have any idea what percentage of reefs globally might be super reefs? And is it realistic to think that they can naturally spread and compensate for the death of reefs globally? So, so far we found one, two, can you grab three, your microphone four, so that five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, so far, we've found about 10 uh, super reefs, um, or parts of reefs that are super. Out of, um, I mean, how many? Well, I mean, there's thousands of coral reef systems across the tropical oceans. We've just started looking. Um, and so, but that's 10 out of goal. thousands, we're talking one ish percent, not five, not 10, not 20. Um, I'd say right now we're at about 5% of what we've, of the reefs that we've studied, maybe 5% are super, um, but we've really only started looking. So the urgency, the, one of the reasons we made this movie and we wanted to get the word out is because we urgently need to find the, 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 all the super reefs so that we can work with the governments and with conservation. Uh, organizations to protect them. I just went to, I had a fantastic experience, um, mostly with Pacific Island dancing, which I love. Uh, I went to an, uh, a, a coral reef island nation called Tuvalu. Um, I went to an, it's a nine coral reefs uh, in this country, and Funafuti is the largest atoll, and 5,000 people live there. Um, and they have established a marine protected area. 
uh, on the west side of the atoll, um, which is a no-take. Uh, we weren't even allowed, allowed to, we sort of snuck in there. Um, all the corals in there were dead in the marine protected area after the 2015 El Nino. The coral reefs that were alive, the super reefs, were all on the north. And those reefs were being dredged to make a harbor. So you can imagine my frustration because, because they put, should have put the MPA in the north and protected those super corals. So it's, this is a, an urgent project that we have going, that we need to go out and we need to find super reefs, tell the countries where the super reefs are so that they can protect them. Because presumably, if you were to protect that one on the north side of the island, it could reseed one that's right next door. But Lizzie, I see you want yeah. to jump in here as well. So but what about reseeding something that's half a world yeah, away? Yeah, so I think there's a, we have to be realistic about the potential for reseeding. Um, there's been a lot of uh, research looking at most reefs are actually self-seeding. So if you lose that stock, that, that larvae there, then they're not able to recover. Um, and so that's why, in addition, one of the things that Anna's looking at is modeling ocean currents, hydrodynamic patterns, because you want to understand where are your source reefs and where are your sink reefs, where are they going? Um, and, and, and you want to not just protect the most resilient ones, but you want to make sure you protect those larval sources, because those are the ones that are responsible for reseeding through ocean currents and connectivity. They did a study in uh, the Coral Triangle, six countries in Indonesia to the Philippines, east to Papua New Guinea and the Solomons. And what they found was that there's remarkable persistence in these current patterns. There's a lot of, of diversity in the currents, but a lot of the reefs are self-seeding and there's some big patterns, big flows that are consistent across time of connectivity. So it happens at multiple scales. And so what we want to be careful of is that we don't assume that just because we protect this reef here, it's going to go help all of these other reefs. It has to do with not just the currents, but the reliability of those currents and their persistence over time. Okay. Very last question. We have one from Facebook. Yep. I, we've had a nice uh, following group of us, group following online, and we want to take one question from them, so I'm passing the mic over. Yeah, we've had a lot of really wonderful questions online. This is one of them from Shu. Uh, planting coral fragments back into the ocean is a common uh, avenue of coral restoration. However, there are views that this is actually a bad idea as it limits the diversity of gene pool um, of the corals being restored, making these areas susceptible to coral diseases and wipe out as they won't have the resilience that a diverse reef would. To Anne and Hanny, what are your views on this practice and how can this form of coral restoration be improved? Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to start answering that. So um, the, one of the biggest coral nursery efforts has been in the Caribbean. It's been with um, three particular species, which have been the acropras, and those were the species that were mostly wiped out in the early 80s due to uh, diseases and pollutions. And so the genetic diversity of those um, species in the wild was already very limited. So actually a lot of the, the restoration efforts went into bringing colonies into uh, safe locations where they couldn't get sick, where they could be regrown, where they could be crossed to increase some of that genetic diversity and then um, outplant them. So it's possible to fragment corals and then if you fragment a colony, you're essentially getting a, a clone, right? It's the same individual that you're now breaking into. And so that does limit the genetic diversity, but I think Coral restoration managers and, and scientists know that, and so they try to be very deliberate about the kind of di genetic diversity that they're playing with. And so they wouldn't necessarily put out a single stock of just one individual fragmented on one reef. They disperse it, and they even oftentimes, um, a lot of the work that's been, been done more recently is testing different genotypes, trying to find genotypes that are more resilient to, to stress, uh, whether that's temperature or sedimentation or things that are local to that environment and then outplant them in that, um, that fashion. So it is not the most perfect thing that we could do. I mean, it would obviously be better if we still had really a wild, thriving, and diverse populations of these species to protect, but because a lot of that genetic loss has already happened, this is one way to actually help recover some of that diversity and, and make sure that those colonies stay safe. I mean, did you want to jump in on that? You know, the, the only other thing I would say when it comes to restoration is that I, I think we have to, it's, it's hard maybe to wrap our 
sort of minds around just how big some of these areas are, right? So the Great Barrier Reef would stretch from Florida to Maine. So it is a huge area. The idea that we're somehow going to engineer our way out of the fact that 50% of the corals on the northern Great Barrier Reef have died, I think, is, is, is kidding ourselves. That restoration simply is not going to be an adequate strategy for that. So um, I think, as Anne said earlier, um, it's going to take a multitude of approaches, um, but we have to be thinking scale. Scale is important, and any sort of any approach that we use, we have to be mindful of that and, and realize that, um, in some sense, um, engineering is, is simply not going to solve this, this particular problem. We need to be thinking bigger and over bigger scales, un unfortunately. I, I just have to, one little caveat, and I, I totally agree with everything Simon just said. Um, I will say, in places where the community depends directly on that reef for food and for coastal protection, restoration can be quite successful in restoring the reef um, if you've addressed the problems that have killed the reef in the first place. So if you had a dynamite blast or a water quality issue and you fix that and then you give the system a jump start by putting baby corals out there, you can actually see really significant recovery in a short amount of time. Where you have chronic heat, it's much more difficult. And so we have to keep in mind, this is a tool in our toolbox, as, it, as you guys have just said, um, and it's very appropriate at small scales. And we're looking at trying to innovate new technologies to implement restoration at broader scales. Um, but currently, um, right now, we're just looking at, at immediate reefs offshore of communities and figuring out how can we scale these up. We are technically about three minutes over time at this point, but I'm hoping you're, you will bear with me for a couple more minutes because, Bester, you said that really one of the main motivations of this film was to introduce a new audience to, quote, feeling positive about the crisis. And so before we all go out to our, our desserts and our drinks, I wonder if we could just go down the table and in like a sentence or two, what is one thing that makes you personally feel positive about this particular crisis? Well, I feel positive because I feel like there are people that are um, engaged in uh, finding not only um, information that helps us understand uh, the science that uh, is important for us to uh, figure out what it is that is happening within our world, but also that there is um, uh, policy reactions to this. And those policy reactions take place both in terms of local communities, but also in terms of governments. Um, and that uh, they aren't necessarily um, huge policy changes that are going to affect our lives right here in Woods Hole, but they are making huge changes in other people's lives where uh, this issue of uh, of um, coral destruction is uh, essential to people's livelihoods. Thank you. As a mom with two young kiddos, um, I would say the next generation, I think we have done a disservice to our children. Um, I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago in Georgia, <laughs> Georgia Tech. Two kids got up, 13 and 12, who started an NGO to get rid of plastics in our oceans. They had raised a million dollars, the brother and sister, the most powerful, compassionate, passionate speakers of all of the scientists who were standing on that stage. Um, I think we've often, we've also heard that there is a, a young girl um, speaking at climate conferences um, from Norway, challenging the adults in the room to take action. Um, and that gives me hope. They are passionate, they are smart, and they are taking action. Yeah, I was actually going to mention her as one of the things that gives me a lot of hope. Um, I think also just seeing the the fact that there is there's a lot more awareness now that that there was. You know, I meet someone on the subway and or in a coffee shop, and they're like, "Oh, what do you do?" I'm like, "Oh, I study corals." They're like, "Oh, that's so great!" Like they're they're in such trouble. Like you really, this is amazing. Like thank you for doing this. And I'm like, "Oh my God!" Like you know, like this is fantastic. Like yes, thank you. It's it's kind of depressing sometimes, but it's also really exciting and really. Um, really nice that people know about this and appreciate it and they understand the urgency and the need to do something about it. So I would say that that's also one of the things that, that keeps me going. <laughs>
I have to admit that um, sometimes I don't feel super hopeful. <laughs> um, But actually, just ha having having you here, um, this turnout tonight is is fantastic and makes me feel that people really care. I I grew up in Africa. Um, I grew up with lions and leopards and great white sharks, and I want my children and my grandchildren to know wild places, to experience wild places. I think coral reef restoration is great. <laughs> but it's not a wild place. I think that's really what motivates me, is wildness um, and maintaining wildness. I think that's pretty much it. Nature is fantastic. It's so interesting and it can just keep you going with its, with its incredible, its incredibleness. That's it. Thanks all for coming. <laughs> Simon, you get the last word. Um, so uh, I would say the thing that gives me the most hope is that I think if given the opportunity and the reason to care that humans are actually an ocean species, that we, that we all have a connection with the ocean that maybe we don't always admit, but I think if we you know, look hard enough it's there and we, we, you know, we have the luxury of working um, in places like Papua New Guinea and in Kiribati where um, the, the, the connection that these people have to the ocean is really is amazing to see and uh, in my heart of hearts I believe that we all have that connection. I think we just need to, we just need to figure out a way to tap into that connection and then I think that if, if we did, um, we, we wouldn't be doing a lot of the things that we're doing. So that's, that's my hope. Right, I lied. I'm actually going to take the very last word um, and say that one thing, I'll be a stereotypical journalist and oversimplify, not all corals are dying, right? That was a huge surprise to me as someone from an ocean science background who covers science. So thank you all for bringing us that surprising and hopeful message um, and for this fabulous discussion tonight. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to our web audience. Sam, would you like to wrap things up. So thank you all for coming to see tonight's film. What a great, what gives me hope is also gatherings like this. So thank you very much for coming. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation and if you'd like to, to support this work and, and other work that happens at uh, the Oceanographic, we did hand out pledge cards. I have one of them here. Um, please feel free to fill this out. Um, you can hand it to me or to any one of the staff members here uh, or just talk to us. We'll give you a business card. We'd love to continue this conversation and everyone is uh, invited to join us in the lobby outside for refreshments and to continue the conversation. And for those of you online, uh, do please visit our website and you can give there as well. All right, thank you much. Thank you.